Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on who you are and where you are. Uh, welcome to episode six of uh, season three of SageMaker Fridays. My name is Julian, and I'm a dev advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. And once again, please meet my co-presenter. Hi, everyone. My name is Ségolène, and I'm a senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. My role is to help customers get their ML project on the right track in order to create business value as fast as possible. Thank you. And as usual, we're live, uh, no slides, and uh, we have also friendly moderators uh, who are waiting for your questions. So please ask all your questions, make sure you learn a lot. And I think there's gonna be a lot to learn. It's a very yeah. action-packed <laughs> and very dense episode today. And it's also a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So what is this episode about? So in this episode, uh, we are going to focus on uh, optimizing costs. Uh, with mm -hmm. machine learning, looking at both the business angle and the technical angle. Okay, so tell me about the business angle. That's new. So yes, <laughs> we are going to have uh, we are we will have a chat with our special guest Greg Coquillo, uh, technology risk manager working for uh, Amazon. Okay. We will we will through we will work through a large scale document processing automation project that it is currently working on for a B2B customer operating in chemicals. Okay, so it's the first time we have a guest, yes. so that's going to be pretty cool. Um, and uh, I hope the discussion will be interesting. Uh, so what about the technical angle? <laughs> We're still going to run code, right? <laughs> exactly. Ah. So in the second part of the episode, uh, we will dive into a large scale computer vision work workload running on SageMaker, mm -hmm. and we will put, pull out all the stops Okay. to optimize cost from uh, image doubling to training to predicting. Okay. Along the way, you will learn about uh, labeling with SageMaker Ground Truth, mm -hmm. right sizing your training infrastructure, mm -hmm. training with, with a managed spot training yes. and pipe mode, ah, pipe mode. deploying <laughs> with <laughs> elastic inference and much more. Okay, so let's not waste any time. Um, we still have an hour. Hopefully we won't go too much <laughs> longer than that, right? Um, so let's introduce Greg. Welcome, Greg. Welcome, Greg, <laughs> uh, to SageMaker Friday. Uh, can you please introduce yourself and uh, explain your role at Amazon, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Sego, uh, for having me. I'm uh, Greg Kokio, Technology Manager for Amazon's uh, Private Brand Division. I provide compliance as a service to uh, my customers. I do promote uh, trust by ensuring products being sold are safe uh, while meeting import and regulatory requirements in all countries where we do business through automated workflows. Currently, I'm responsible for the technology roadmap and I drive AI and ML adoption for my department. And I do so by leading projects in collaboration with the global teams comprised of data scientists and software engineers. Uh, actually, most of my projects fall in the innovation category for our customers. And uh, the minimum uncertainty embedded in AI ML projects is something I do enjoy. And the strategy I actually uh, I typically use is prioritizing business use cases based on needs, efforts, impact, followed by uh, building and testing a minimum viable product that can scale once we test it and validate it. This is great. Thank you so much, Greg, for this uh, introduction. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, your customer and the challenge they were uh, facing? Sure thing. Our customer is a B2B multinational uh, working in the chemical industry. Uh, as you may know, per regulatory requirement, uh, manufacturers in the chemical industry must collect what we call material safety data sheets from all of their suppliers. And they must produce their own material safety data sheets containing elements from documents uh, collected from their suppliers so they can sell their products to their own customers. So these documents, most of the time, they're received in different languages uh, and, and they're coming from all over the world. Uh, so in these, uh, we can go through an example as you yeah, see. Let's, um, let's show my screen. Yeah, let's show my screen for, for a second. And uh, and we can see uh, we can see some examples. There's actually a good example on Wikipedia, if you're interested. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, uh, well, this is very new to me. So it says material safety data sheet, and it's got a product name, which is chromium three acetate hydroxide, whatever that is. That's, that doesn't sound nice. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's the information you you were uh, referring to, Greg, right? Uh, that, that is toxicity. that is correct. Yeah. Can you walk us that, through this example. So this example, really uh, a high level of uh, material safety data sheets is a document that helps you as a consumer of that product, how to store and manipulate uh, this chemical. And also in case of emergency, how do you protect yourself? What do you do? Um, when to call 911 or when to uh, provide immediate emergency response in case of an accident, et cetera. So in this case, there are multiple claims. There are multiple information, technical information about the chemical. So uh, uh, as a manufacturer, you want to collect a lot of information about this document because you are also taking all of these components and making a finished product that you need to build your own material safety data sheets that you need to give to the other consumer you're selling to. So, okay, in this yeah, case, so it's have... about yeah, extracting information from such documents. And here's another example from the uh, European community. Correct. And yeah. See, you know, similar. Yeah. And yeah, text and labels and, and pictograms and Etc. Et exactly. So if you're if you have 20 chemicals that go into your finished product, then you want to extract the information from the 20 data sheets and consolidate everything into a single data sheet for your own product. Right. That's the that's the name of the game. Yeah. Especially the, the safety critical aspects of these chemicals when you mix them together. You want to make sure you, you, you capture that. So again, as you said, text extraction, signatures, pictograms, addresses, you want to be to, to be able to uh, extract that. And also making sure signatures and addresses uh, document, um, uh, what do you say, um, uh, identification, you want to make sure you're not leaving any suppliers out because you do have to have every supplier's material safety data sheets in your database. Okay, thank you so much, Greg, and it seems a very important and crucial use case. Um, can you tell me more about uh, how your customer is currently doing uh, the extraction and so on uh, today? Before the work was performed by a global team of 60 employees uh, processing 100 to 150 documents daily for a yearly headcount of 2.1 million. And uh, bottlenecks were due to data latency as they key in this data, extracted data, uh, lack of traceability of supplier MSDS uh, to produce their own for their finished goods. Uh, therefore, customers would most likely receive products without an MSDS, which is again a, a, a red flag if you get audited by the government. Uh, customers are also subject to regulatory fines from the government uh, when found non-compliant. Actually, uh, other bottlenecks include lack of subject matter expertise were uh, multilingual, so it took time to translate and validate foreign documents. Oh, cool. So uh, I think I heard the bottleneck. I... <laughs> Manual work. Manual work. So I've got Surely. a question for you. Why is it a good problem to solve with machine learning? <laughs> Well, uh, I, I must say, document, ex you know, text extraction, and is is a big problem a lot of companies are going through. And machine learning is a great solution because it can automate this revision process through natural language processing. When you think about how a human reviews a document, you can immediately realize that most of the work it includes uh, text detection, translation entity extraction, like identifying and validating a chemical name or a company address. And part of that automation also includes computer vision for detection and extraction of pictograms. And those pictograms are telling you whether it's a dangerous chemical or semi-dangerous, et cetera, and even signatures for authentication of documents. Mm -hmm. So again, I heard text detection, text translation, computer vision. Um, what does the uh, automated workflow look like? As a, as a, so yes, yeah, so as a solution, uh, we created a web portal for the supplier to submit the MSDS sheet uh, for their raw materials at the time of shipping. So this submission uh, triggers a series of Lambda functions that perform uh, different tasks. 
Uh, we go through uh, these API calls of these AI services, uh, whether it's Amazon Text Track, Translate, Comprehend, and uh, Recognition. And this is where we're extracting uh, different things, translating from German to English, or identifying that supplier, their location, or uh, detecting a pictogram for safety measures, or even identifying key claims inside of that document. So we can so, yeah, uh, walk we, through. I think we, let's uh, show my screen, and uh, we have a, a sample architecture. So it's not the actual ar architecture that you implemented because we're not allowed to show it, as uh, as everybody will understand. <laughs> but this is close enough, and this is really typical of building such a such a pipeline. So, uh, Greg, walk us through the the main blocks here and how they work together. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, high level, you have the ingestion model module, and again, it's uh, pretty accurate to what we worked on for the customer. And you have the OCR module, NAP module. There's also the computer vision module, and it actually starts with ingesting that document into an S3 bucket and push through a Lambda function. To me, a Lambda function drives traffic and it's a short piece of code that runs on serverless infrastructure and uh, guides it to the different uh, portion of that uh, uh, architecture. And it lands onto Amazon Text Tract. Then you extract some metadata about that document and uh, you uh, push it through Comprehend and uh, export all of that th uh, data into a Redshift table it could be an S, another S3 bucket. Uh, it depends on what your solution needs to be. In this case, you can see that uh, the whole extraction makes it through some analytics module uh, leveraging Neptunes or uh, ES service, and it could be uh, different uh, solutions that we, we have. So for us, we have a, a different infrastructure where we're leveraging uh, Redshift tables and also uh, Amazon Elastic Search Service to create a searchable document repository. And so what, I can about, also what about from, metrics? What's the what's the improvement that you saw? So big improvements in this case, cost improved by 70 percent. We're able to reduce headcount to 20 people for a total of seven hundred thousand dollars a year. And we also saw a 90 percent uh, plus reduction in uh, manual errors and also a 50 percent throughput improvement, uh, which allows our customer to scale and onboard multiple suppliers. As you know, you cannot rely on only one supplier. Uh, when it comes to producing your products, if you want uh, uh, assurance in terms of supplying to your own customers. And also about the model itself, the average performance was around 96%. However, we focused on minimizing false negatives instead of false positives, simply because we wouldn't want to misidentify a dangerous chemical as not dangerous. Definitely, yes, and uh, I love such metrics. And uh, accuracy is very important, especially in your case, and especially for safety application. Uh, how do you make sure uh, this information is correct? Absolutely. We Inside of that infrastructure, we also have Amazon Augmented AI, which allows us to build a human-in-the-loop system for our customer. Uh, it, this allows users to review model inferences that didn't cross a set confidence level threshold. The good thing about Amazon A2I is that it provides a continuous improvement environment to, for the model, uh, allowing them to retrain using uh, human updated predictions. Cool, thank you. So human in the loop plus uh, pure um, deep learning model. So any tips and best practice you could share with us? Yeah, absolutely. I have uh, a couple of do's. Uh, to me, I always like to tell everyone to start small. Uh, for example, selecting suppliers based on one country to test and validate your proof of concept. Uh, also, it's important to fully explore the end-to-end -end business processes, making sure you understand how transactional data flows throughout these processes. Uh, lastly, I believe that programs precede technology. Therefore, you should focus on uh, creating the program and how it its workflows have a clear understanding uh, and its workflows uh, to have a clear understanding of where technology needs to be injected. Uh, a couple of don'ts, uh, do not try to solve all issues at the same time. Uh, the first phase of your project can just be text extraction and that can be a great start uh, for you to build on. 
Um, one thing I wish I knew earlier uh, was that our customer was also building a, an ERP tool uh, in-house. Uh, now they want us to integrate our solution within their tool. Uh, this will take working with their team of software engineers. However, I just see this as an extension of uh, the current project uh, more than anything else. Okay, thank you so much, Greg. Uh, that's a really nice project, and we wish you all the best for the next step. But I think now it's high time to <laughs> dive deep into cost optimization on SageMaker. Absolutely, and thank you, Greg. This was a, a very, very interesting discussion. I, I learned quite a lot, and uh, it was thank a you. pleasure to have you on the episode. Right, and uh, let's let's stay in touch. I'm I'm curious what you're going to build next. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thanks a lot. Um, so now it's time to talk about SageMaker, yeah. and uh, and we saw in Greg's project how uh, we could integrate different uh, high-level mm -hmm. services, and um, you know you could always uh, also uh, find room for custom modeling. Maybe mm -hmm. if you want to do a very specific uh, image detection in, in those documents, you know you may want to build a computer vision model. So that's mm -hmm. my excuse for talking about computer vision. <laughs> And and we're going to build a large scale, uh, a large scale. Uh, we're going to work with a large scale data set, which is the ImageNet data set, mm -hmm. which is pretty big. It's uh, over a million images in a thousand classes, and we're going to train it on a distributed GPU cluster. Um, so we're training from scratch because this this could be, you know, the reason for this would be I have a unique data set, right? Uh, and I can't find a pre-trained model that works for me. Uh, or maybe I want to build um, uh, I want to build a pre-trained model mm -hmm. uh, and that my data scientist can use as a baseline for uh, fine-tuning on other tasks. So there are some good reasons to train from scratch, right? Um, so we're going to use ImageNet. So uh, maybe just to remind everybody what ImageNet is and how important it is. Can you say a few right. words about it? <laughs> yeah, we already talked about uh, ImageNet. Yeah, we already did. ImageNet dataset is really the reference dataset for many computer vision applications. Uh, it has revolutionized the field of large-scale uh, visual recognition and serves as a benchmark for many computer vision models. As a reminder, this project was, la was launched more than 10 years ago by Fefeli in order to provide researchers a high-quality level image dataset. And um, as a result, ImageNet is a dataset of over 50 15 million labeled high resolution image belonging to roughly 22,000 categories mm -hmm. organized according to, to the WorldNet uh, hierarchy, in which each node of the hierarchy is detected by hundreds and thousands of images. Okay, so the, ver the version we're using is a little smaller, it's 1.2 million images in a thousand classes. So let's, as, as usual, let's start by looking at the data set. Uh, so I have to say the most difficult thing with the image that data set is to download it because it's <laughs> 150 gigabytes uh, and it takes quite a while to download. It actually took me five days using an EC2 instance. Uh, so in a nutshell, you go to the, uh, uh, you go to the uh, ImageNet uh, website mm -hmm. and let me show you the script here. Uh, here it is. Sorry. Okay. And uh, and so you um, you get a username, you get an access key, and uh, and you can actually use a a pretty nice script from the TensorFlow repository, as you can see here, uh, to to download it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, make sure you launch this in a way that doesn't get interrupted, you know, no hub or something similar, because again, it's gonna take days. Uh, and so. Then uh, once you have the data set, and, and we can uh, we can see it here, right? We can see it is that's the training set, and then the validation set. So just just under 150 gigs. So when you extract it, um, you get something similar to this, right? And obviously each one of those. Is an ImageNet category with category with images, right? And yeah, that's uh, said. This this is pretty big, right? 
uh, so we don't want to we don't want to have to move all those images around, right? It's uh, you know, see <laughs> see how long it takes you computer science. It's it's over a million images, so yeah. we don't want to have to deal with uh, a file tree of million mm -hmm. images. And I'm even going to stop this because you know it takes forever, <laughs> as you can see. And the validation images are are similar. Okay, so instead of of working with a million plus images. We're going to pack them mm -hmm. in about a hundred files. Okay, uh, so this makes it easier to move the files around, and it makes it easier to distribute the files to the different GPUs, right? And um, and so the technique that I'm I'm using here is um, uh, I'm using a, a file format called Record IO, okay, which is part of Apache MXNet, mm -hmm. and the reason I'm using this one is because I'm going to train with the image classification algorithm in SageMaker, which is implemented uh, with Apache MXNet. But if you use um, um, TensorFlow, there's a TF record format that's ex very similar. And uh, and I'm not sure about PyTorch. I'll be honest with you, I know a little less about PyTorch than other frameworks. But I wouldn't be surprised if there was an equivalent format for PyTorch. Okay. So uh, the good thing is we can just run a simple tool. Which is called IM to Rex so or images to record IO. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, we just say, hey, give me um, uh, six chunks for the validation data set and give me 140 chunks for the training set. And, and IM to Rex will just do that for you. Okay. And if you wonder how I came up with those values, it's simply because what I get is this okay so i get a hundred and i think it's 140 yes 140 files and as you can see there are about 300 megabytes which is large enough you know to reduce obviously the 1.2 million images to 140 files um but it's still small enough that i can efficiently distribute it distribute those files across the, the training cluster okay so and this is a this is a simple process it, it really takes a few minutes and I have uh, just six files for validation because it's it's a much smaller data set right so you have the script uh, you can you can run it uh, very easy no 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 difficulty here once you're done put everything into s3 and then SageMaker can start working with this okay like I said the the main problem is uh, downloading image memory, <laughs> right? Yeah, five days. Okay, um, but there's another problem, right? <laughs> because here we have uh, we have a label data set, right? Images are organized in in, mm -hmm. in folders. Each folder is a category. Mm -hmm. So what if we need to start from scratch? Uh -uh. Uh, so let's backtrack <laughs> and talk about data labeling. And you, you would think, why is data labeling a cost problem? Well, it's a cost problem because mm -hmm. as Greg explained, you know, manual work, um, it's very expensive. And if you need to label millions of images, Windows. you need a, a large team. It takes a lot of time. You need tools. It's it's a problem. OK, so instead, uh, we can use a tool called SageMaker Ground Truth. OK, so I'm just going to show you a couple of labeling steps. Um, if you're interested in setting things up and, and the end to end demo, uh, please go and take a look at my YouTube channel, uh, which should be easy enough to find. Uh, there's a four part uh, series on uh, ground truth. OK, so that's uh, the, the extensive demo here. I'm just going to go with the, the simple demo where I have a workforce set up. Right, so the workforce is just me. It's not a very powerful workforce, right? Uh, so just a single worker. And that worker can uh, start working on labeling images. And so I created a labeling job where I'm going to be labeling guitars, right? Uh -huh. So I have a few images and I want to do semantic segmentation on guitars, okay? So that's, that's my input data. And uh, so let's get to work. Okay, and I'm going to show you this and just uh, log in to the worker portal, which I've already done, as you can see. Okay, 
and I can start working. And I'm presented with images and uh, where instructions are extremely detailed instructions. <laughs> I should do better. OK, please segment guitars and bass guitars. OK, so let's try this. So is this a guitar or a bass guitar? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> See, OK, so you're, you would be a terrible laborer. I'm sorry. You need to know your heavy metal bands. All right. So it is a guitar. So I'm going to select the guitar label. And I can use this auto segmentation tool, which is really cool. And voila. And voila. Right? <laughs> and I can see a little bit here hasn't been uh, hasn't been properly uh, labeled. So I can take the brush and I can say, hey, this is actually part of it. Right? It's like a coloring book. It's a very relaxing <laughs> activity and fine. Right? And I can say, all right, zoom out. Looks good to me. Submit. Okay, I'll do another one and then we move on, right? Because I can do this all day. Uh, so here's another one. So obviously, yes. no, two on guitars. The left, on the left. No, it's a guitar as well. Oh, so. And the I, right? On the left? No, they're both oh. guitars. Oh. Right? Oops. All right. So yeah, we're still missing a bit. But that's okay. And let's do this one. So you can see it auto the tools in. in uh, in SageMaker Ground Truth, make it very easy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to submit and, you know, and stop because I don't want to spend too much time on this. But you get the idea, right? Okay, this, this one, is this, this, this is, is the bass. Right. Yeah, this is the bass. All right. Although it's not a four-string bass, but that's a different story. It's still a bass. Um, and so you go through those images and, and uh, Ground Truth will support, uh, uh, you know, image classification, object detection, bounding boxes and segmentation, mm -hmm. as well as text workloads and 3D uh, point cloud workloads, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'm just flying through ground truth here. Please go and take a look at the video. So once you're done, okay, so I'm gonna stop and resume later. Okay, once you're done, uh, you have a fully labeled data set. And of course, you need a better workforce than just me. So you could distribute this to uh, a bigger private workforce. Mm -hmm. You can distribute it to uh, uh, an AWS partner, mm -hmm. and you can distribute this um, and scale scale out on mechanical Make territory. Yeah. So once you're done, okay, you can quickly see the, those those uh, images have been labeled, and more importantly, you get information in S3, which I actually copied to my EC2 instance. And we see what we call the augmented manifest, which is the list of images with um, uh, annotation information. In this case, the, the mask, uh, a pointer to the, the picture containing the image mask that mm -hmm. I drew on mm -hmm. the guitars. And I can use this for training. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is really the, the bulk of it. Now here, obviously, I, it's a toy uh, example, but if we had a million images to do, mm -hmm. we wouldn't do one million images manually, right? <laughs> Not me. No. So especially <laughs> since you can't tell a bass from a guitar. Uh, so what, what would we do? <laughs> so Sage Maker Ground Truth, uh, would have a very interesting feature in our case, which is the automatic uh, labeling one, which is going to use some active learning techniques to cut down on data labeling costs. Indeed, active learning is a machine learning technique that identifies data that should be labeled by your worker and data that can be automatically labeled. Automated data labeling helps a lot to reduce the cost and time that it takes to label your data sets comparing to labeling everything manually. Yeah, so it's a combination. So we start mm -hmm. manually. Yeah. And then uh, a model is trained on the uh, on the labeled images, mm -hmm. which you know are a, a small or growing data set, right? Mm -hmm. And then when the model is good enough and can actually predict as well or even better as the uh, Human. the humans, then it starts labeling uh, it's at scale, right? Yeah. And it's a huge, huge speed up and a huge uh, cost saving. Cost well. saving, definitely. Yes. Okay. All right. So now we know how to uh, accelerate our labeling efforts. So uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about data storage and data loading. And as we saw, uh, so once again, uh, we have let me show you 
this uh, data set again, right? So we split it, we saw the script, right? And we end up with this um, large data set, which we sync, right? To mm -hmm. an S3 bucket, right? Um, and once we have that, then we can get to work, okay? So let me jump to the notebook. And so what we've done, okay, is we've synced our training and validation set into S3. Okay, so the rec, uh, dot .rec files are in S3. We have the training channel, we have the validation channel. Mm -hmm. So remember, it's 150 gigs. Mm -hmm. So who wants to copy 150 gigabytes on each training instance every time you fire up a training job? No. no. <laughs> I actually tried it. Uh, even if you have a, an instance with 100 gigabit networking, it takes more than 20 minutes. So, which unfortunately you pay for. Um, so you don't want to do that. You don't want to wait for 20 minutes. You don't want to pay for 20 minutes. So this is where we can use pipe mode. Pipe. Okay. And so configuring it is very easy, right? When you define your training input, and we've done this a million times, uh, we usually ha didn't have this parameter, mm -hmm. and the default value is called file, which mm -hmm. means copy everything to the instance. Instead, we're going to say pipe, which means don't stream, uh, don't copy anything, stream it. Mm -hmm. So SageMaker will stream the training set from S3 to your training instances, mm -hmm. and we'll see in the training log uh, in a few minutes that there isn't any time spent on downloading because we're not downloading any data; mm -hmm. we're streaming. Okay, so we're streaming uh, the training set and we're streaming the validation yeah. set. There is another benefit, as we said, is now that the data set is actually split in 140 files, this is very, this makes it very easy to uh, distribute it. Mm. So one rec file can go to one instance and another rec file can go to another instance, right? Um, so it's a uh, data parallelism, as we've seen in the previous episode. Uh, but we want to make sure each instance gets a different subset, mm -hmm. right? Because it would be a problem if if you train for 100 epochs and each instance got the same right. subset of the data set mm -hmm. all the time. So we use this thing called a shuffle config with a, a, a random seed. Um, and uh, and this will shuffle the record IO files and okay. distribute different files to each instance. Okay. But apart from that, it's really what we've seen before. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so now let's move on to uh, let's move on to training. Okay, um, so we have our data in S3. Uh, we define our channels. Uh, we grab the image classification algo. Mm -hmm. Right? Have I, have I said business as usual already? Not no? yet. So okay, so there we go. Right, there we go. It's <laughs> business as usual. Although I don't have the t-shirt today. Um, and now we can configure the training job. And so I've got a question here. Yes, please. <laughs> which kind of uh, which instance do we need to pick out? Okay, good question. Because Thank you. So I'm um, reading your stuff and I'm wondering. Um, so it's pretty obvious here we want to go with the GPU instance. Okay. Okay. We are using it's a, the the image classification algo is using a, a, a ResNet mm -hmm. uh, image classifier, so it's deep learning and Deep learning training means GPUs. Okay. But as always, we should start small, right? Mm -hmm. So I actually run a quick test, right? Uh, I'm not showing this in the interest of time. Uh, so as you can see here, oh, sorry, um, we ran um, a quick test on a P3 2XL instance, mm -hmm. which is a single GPU instance. And I set batch size to 128 because it's a default value, and I thought, you know, why not? And you know, I'm lazy, so I, I like default values. And I found out this was actually training at about 335 images per second. Mm -hmm. So given that we have over 1.2 million, we can estimate that one epoch will take uh, about an hour and four minutes. Okay. You can say, well, all right, but 
Is that good, bad? Well, assuming that you want to train for at least 100 or 150 efforts, mm -hmm. right? It means you will end up training for 158 hours. And that's about 6.5 mm -hmm. days. So that's a full week. It's a full week of training and you can't do much, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to wait for your results. So from a business perspective, this is not really, no, it's right? It's too long. Mm -hmm. It's too long. Um, from a cost perspective, this instance costs $3.825 per hour. So training costs would be a little less than $600, mm -hmm. which sounds reasonable. But again, the 6.5 days are, yeah, are so terrible. Cool. And the productivity waste here mm -hmm. kind of, you know, makes the training cost totally irrelevant, mm -hmm. right? You can't iterate if you have to wait for a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next step would be let's try a multi GPU instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have different ones, and I took the biggest because <laughs> uh, why not? And so I'm using P3DN 24XL, which has eight GPUs. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, notice that a way to save a few cents, but mm -hmm. that counts, is to set the instant storage to the minimum value, which is really one gigabyte. Because remember, we are not copying. We are streaming. We are streaming. So we don't need local storage on the training instances. We just need a little bit of storage to save the model. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. So the default value is 30 gigabytes. So you can compute. It's really pennies, you know, for a training job. But if you add up, you know, thousands of training jobs, mm -hmm. you know, why waste good storage? Uh, and pay for stuff you don't use. So you can set your volume size to one. Uh, okay, hyperparameters. So ResNet, 50 layers. I am not using a pre-trained model. Okay. Okay, we're training from scratch. We have a thousand classes. We have a lot of images. Um, batch size is now 1024 because I've got eight GPUs multiplied by uh, okay. reasonable default. Uh, I set a learning rate of 0.4 because you know, I just want to train for a couple of epochs just to show you results. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very high value. Uh, we're going to do a, a little bit of image augmentation to make things even more complicated. And we're going to use, uh, we're going to synchronize uh, gradient updates, uh, which mm -hmm. is usually a more accurate way to train. Uh, I'm not going into the distributed training discussion here again. This is based on the native distributed training feature in MXNet mm -hmm. because we're using an MXNet implementation. If you use TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera, et cetera, you can use uh, lots of different options and go and watch uh, the previous <laughs> episode, right? Which tells you everything you need to know about mm -hmm. distributed training. Okay. But whatever you're using, Whatever framework you're using, whatever distributed technique you're using, I think everything we're talking about today will apply. Okay, okay. it's not MXNet specific. Okay. It's not specific to built-in algos. Uh, it's just uh, you know this will apply whatever you do. Okay, um, and then we train. Okay, so uh, um, yeah, go ahead. When you do some training, uh, how do we know that uh, all your GPUs are uh, busy enough? Yeah, because I, I picked a random, well, not random, a default value for batch size. Okay. And, and this will influence how full GPU memory is going okay. to be. So I'll be honest with you, at this point, I don't really know. Okay. okay? Um, so let's see how we do on this training. Okay. And then we'll answer your question. Okay, we'll Thank figure you. it out. So P3DN 24XL is more expensive, uh, but it's fast. Okay, <laughs> and we train... Now, time per epoch is down to 727 seconds, okay? So if we train for 150 epochs, yeah. now we only train for 30 hours instead of 158 hours. So about five times faster, mm. okay? Uh, but the cost is twice as much. Mm. So some people will say, oh, that's a good deal. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm, I wanna go five times faster if I'm paying twice the cost, mm. right? Uh, some people will say, I want to go much faster and I want to pay even less. And that's the point of this episode, right? It's you. you go yeah, yeah, because I'm lazy and I'm, I'm cheap, <laughs> right? And impatient. So it should be fast, it should be inexpensive, it should be easy. And so I'm going to do all three for you, okay? <laughs> so we, are, we have a good speed up, but we spend a little too much here. So now, 
In fact, one quick optimization we can do is uh, we can look at, uh, we can describe this training job that we ran. Okay, and see, that's the one, you know, 1024. And we can look at, uh, we can look at um, uh, CloudWatch. Uh, where's my CloudWatch? We can look at CloudWatch metrics. Just, I want to show you the, the two options that you have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I can take any of those. Okay, and if you look in the SageMaker console, you'll see um, instance metrics mm -hmm. that tell you about GPU utilization, uh, GPU memory utilization, which is the one we are looking for here. Okay. And you can see, right? So if you have eight GPUs, this maxes out at 800. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. So, but that's a different training job. Yeah. So in this case, Go back to this. In this case, looking at CloudWatch, I can see it's only 300%. Mm -hmm. So I'm, it means I'm only using my GPU memory at 37.5%. Okay. So I can do, you know, a rule of thumb here and say, well, I can increase the batch size quite mm -hmm. a lot. So now I'm going to I'm going to train again with uh, 2736 batch size okay. instead of 1024 because I can just push more mem more, <laughs> more data to this, okay? Um, but there's a better way uh, to do this. You can actually use um, the profiling capability okay. in SageMaker Debugger, uh, which only takes this extra parameter, right? Okay, so generate me a profiling report. Mm -hmm. uh, same, everything is, is still the same, okay? So I train again. Um, and uh, I can see now, if I go back to uh, my debugging information in, uh, in Studio, I can see, okay, so GPU utilization is very high, good. stable at 99. GPU memory is pretty good, mm -hmm. right? I, but I could still probably increase uh, a little bit more, okay? Uh, but we're, we're going to stop doing that. But you can, you can go and increase the value until you really max out uh, GPU memory here, okay? And this information is generated automatically for you by the, the profiler in, um, in SageMaker Debugger. Okay, so it's, uh, it's pretty good. And there's so much more to uh, SageMaker Debugger. We'll, we'll probably come back to it in more detail. You get detailed profiling information for each node. You can download a profiling report, um, but yeah, just, for now, we just want to fix that batch size issue, okay? So we did increase batch size. It didn't really speed things up, um, which was surprising. I'm guessing this is because <laughs> of uh, the, the cost of synchronization. Okay. And the, the, synchronize, the heavy synchronization in distributed training here is probably kind of killing my performance a bit, but um, it delivers better accuracy, so fine. But generally, it's a good idea to max out GPU memory. Okay, so now we know we're making very good use of that one instance. Mm -hmm. So we can go and add another one, right? Mm. But we don't want to pay twice. Uh, no. no. <laughs> so we're going to start introducing managed spot training. Okay. So I'm sure you're familiar with spot instances on EC2. And uh, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, we can uh, we can uh, get access to unused capacity in EC2, mm -hmm. and we get a very significant discount. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I'm bumping this job to two instances, and I'm setting up spot instances, which really means you know yes, true, and uh, and do I want to wait for spot instances? Okay. So same hyperparameters. Now I call fit, okay, and let me show you because you're not going to believe it otherwise. At the oops, at the end of the training log, uh -oh. you see you saved seventy percent. Yeah. So even though we trained for a total of twenty six thirty six seconds, we only pay for seven ninety, which is cool. Which is good. So hiding this. What does it mean from a, from a, a cost perspective? So it means, let me find that thing again. Yes. So it means, uh, and this is the one, yes. Check it. 
Yes. So now time per epoch is 378 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice speed up, about twice faster. Mm -hmm. And the cost, thanks to the 70% discount, is actually divided by three. So compared to the previous scenario, we're twice faster, three times cheaper. Better and better. Very good. <laughs> so I want to push this. So how about we try four instances? Same job. Just you know, add two more. Everything else is the same. Time per epoch is now 198 seconds, mm -hmm. right? Which is twice faster again. And there's a very minor cost increase. I'm not even sure it's significant, right? It's a little inefficiency in the distribution, but you could say it's almost flat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so almost linear scaling. And you know me, I want to push this. What about eight instances? So now we're getting into crazy territory because that's 64 GPUs. Uh, it's a, a silly amount of CUDA cores, okay. and it's only two terabytes of GPU RAM. And this is actually eight petaflops of uh, um, fuse multiply add matrix operation. So FMA is uh, okay. multiply A by B plus C, which is really what convolution does, right? So this is an eight petaflop deep learning machine. Let that sink in. Uh, so eight instances, same hyperparameters. Time per epoch is 99 seconds. Oh, well, well. Twice faster, same cost. And I, I, I swear, I didn't cook those numbers. Okay. So where are we now? We are, we started at 158 hours. And if we if we had used a spot mm -hmm. instance for that initial instance, we would have paid probably around one hundred and seventy dollars. And we end up at four point twelve hours, okay, which is forty three times faster. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not even twice the initial cost. So who wouldn't want to speed things up forty three x for not even twice the cost? It's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. For a Friday, yes. Yeah, for a Friday, it's pretty good. <laughs> so you can see, you know, scaling and cost optimization are really linked. Mm -mm -mm. So people think scaling is just about increasing capacity. But if you scale right, you can actually save money or, you know, spend very little money in comparison to the increased uh, speed up or capacity that you are. That you get. This is a really good example. And it's yeah. almost linear, right? Yeah, and it's almost linear. Yes. Uh, so from one to two to four to eight, it's almost a straight line. I didn't try 16, but I, I should. <laughs> but it, you know, I gotta stop somewhere. So we're gonna save more money, but let's uh let's uh I have a surprise for you. We're gonna save even more money, but um let's talk about uh, a few more things. So Assuming we wanted to train for a long time, mm -hmm. right? let's say we want to train for 150 epochs, lots of bad stuff could happen inside mm -hmm. our training job, right? Uh, and we want to be able to detect those problems mm -hmm. and potentially stop train jobs that are just bound to fail, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there's a, a capability in SageMaker Debugger that lets us do this, and we have built-in rules. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, uh, uh, is the model overfitting? Is loss not decreasing? Do we have vanishing gradients? Do we have exploding tensors? Which are all terrible conditions. Terrible. Yeah. The worst one. <laughs> so you know, really, your your training process is failing. Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's as easy as setting those, and uh, SageMaker will actually detect that uh, something is happening, and uh, and it will send a notification that you could catch on CloudWatch events. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this could trigger a Lambda function that stops the job. You could say, well, you know, my, my, my training job is going totally wrong. Um, I should stop it. And this is a good way to save money as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll share links to all that stuff yeah, uh, on, the it's super on the last slide. Mm -hmm. It's, it's pretty easy to set up. So Sage McCurdy Burger will help me eliminate, uh, bad training jobs. And uh, so in, here I'm going to train for uh, just, you know, a few more epochs, just 10 epochs to keep this uh, pretty short. But you could train for, you know, 
150 epochs, 200 epochs, uh, using you know, learning rate scheduling, using early stopping, mm -hmm. which is another good technique. Mm -hmm. So if uh, if uh, your uh, loss or uh, you know is not decreasing, then you could stop again. That's mm -hmm. another technique to to stop bad jobs. <clears throat> okay. So we trained this for a little while, and now we want to deploy it. Okay. And ask me your question again. <laughs> <laughs> How can I deploy? <laughs> What does it mean? <laughs> so, which instance do you want to pick? Right? Oh, yes, okay. Uh, so, you, you know, deep learning equal GPU, right? Uh, so, sure. So, uh, let's say it's a low traffic endpoint. Mm -hmm. We could just grab, um, we could just grab uh, the least uh, expensive okay. uh, instance, which is the uh, MLG4DNXL. And this one has a, a one NVIDIA T4 okay. GPU. Which has eight teraflops of uh, FP32 uh, uh, processing power, and it's it's not expensive at all. So we would just call deploy and say, well, there you go, and we can go and predict. Okay. But maybe maybe this is still too much processing power. Mm -hmm. And of course, you could say, well, I'm going to deploy on a CPU instance, which is going to be very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very inexpensive, but it's going to be very slow ah. for a large model. And it's not even a huge model. So imagine a bigger model like BERT or you know, something like that. Uh, you don't want to wait for five seconds for each prediction. So you're stuck between very inexpensive CPU instances, but very slow for some models, and between uh, fast GPU instances, but a bit expensive for your use case. <clears throat> so there's the middle ground. And the middle ground is called Amazon Elastic Index. And it's one of my favorite services. And this is very simple. You de you actually deploy on a CPU instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you find the CPU instance that works best. Uh, and I took a C5XL, which is kind of similar to uh, CPU capabilities of the GPU instance. And you add an uh, elastic inference accelerator. Mm -hmm. And they come in three uh, sizes medium large x large mm -hmm. okay from one to two to four teraflops mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's a fraction of a gpu if you want from a performance perspective so and as you can see the combination of that cpu instance and of the accelerator is very cost effective compared to uh, to the gpu instance okay so you can find you can experiment and you can find the right cost uh, performance ratio mm -hmm. Right. If you don't need a, a full-fledged GPU instance, you can get, you know, a fraction of it and save, you know, 50, 60 percent mm -hmm. of the inference cost. Okay. Um, and of course, there are other techniques like uh, auto-scaling your mm -hmm. endpoints, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, which are available in SageMaker, and maybe we'll uh, we'll show you that. Um, but in a nutshell, this is what I wanted to show you, right? Mm -hmm. So again, scaling and cost are, are on AWS are always very linked mm -hmm. and very, totally related. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the same. You could even say it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you scale right, you shouldn't spend much more money mm -hmm. and you might just save money actually mm -hmm. by scaling right, right? Uh, and I think SageMaker is a good example. So. So I promised I would show you how to save more and we can actually save more. And we can save more because we have this new feature that's a week or two weeks old, uh, which is called savings plans. And savings plan is basically a way uh, to get pretty deep discounts, as you will see in a minute, in exchange for a commitment. So mm -hmm. you commit to spending a certain amount of money mm -hmm. for one year or three years on SageMaker, mm -hmm. okay? And this is measured in dollars per hour and you can get a good discount. Oh. So you can go and, and uh, again, read the blog post and read all about it. Let, let's, uh, and let's show you what it looks like in my own account. Okay. Uh, so, and you can see, you can see my span here, which was uh, not reasonable at all, okay? <laughs> Right now, you understand why I joined AWS because I don't pay my bills. Open bar, <laughs> open bar, yeah, absolutely. And I, I spent quite a lot preparing the demo, as you can see. 
Anyway, so let's go back to this. So you go to recommendations and say, okay, I'm interested in SageMaker. And uh, so I want to do maybe a one-year plan. Mm -hmm. I don't want to pay anything up front. <laughs> kind of cheap. And please give me a recommendation based on my, uh, yeah, my seven days of usage. Okay. So right now I spend a little more than $3,000 per month on mm -hmm. SageMaker. Okay, and if I actually committed uh, to um, spending $2.205 per hour mm -hmm. for a year, mm -hmm. okay, I could save 60% okay. compared to the on-demand cost. And this would save me $500 per year, uh, per month. Per month. Okay, per month. Okay, and no upfront, right? No. So just add the plans to the cart, uh, select it, it, activate it, and then that's it. I start saving 500 bucks every month, right? So, of course, if I said, hmm, what about a three-year? <laughs> will I still be working for you in three years? Probably, <laughs> hopefully. Um, still no upfront. I would have a commitment of 1.544, and I could save 30%, 32, right? Wow, one cent. And obviously, if I decided, oh, I'm uh, I'm gonna call my boss and ask him to pay <laughs> for upfront for three years of SageMaker usage, right? I could get up to thirty six percent savings. Okay, so in a nutshell, in just a few minutes, again, there's a little more to a savings plan than this. You can create your custom plans. Uh, you don't have to use that recommendation value. You can commit to a little less if you want to be a little more conservative. But just this will save you a silly amount of money mm -hmm. on your Sage Maker bills. So imagine I applied, you know, let's say a 30% saving to my job, right? Let me go back to this. Okay. Uh, so I would now I wouldn't spend $383. I would spend a little more than $250, mm -hmm. right? And I'd start getting really close to the cost of that single instance job, right? So scaling right and then using all the optimization mechanisms, you can really, really save a ton of money, right? So don't let anyone tell you uh, cloud is expensive or SageMaker is expensive. If if it's expensive, then you know go and share that video and uh, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, then you can they can invite you for dinner because you just literally save them potentially thousands of dollars per month. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And now they don't have to wait six five six point five days for no. that training job. So it's a win 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 situation. <laughs> save you money is uh, is what I love uh, mm -hmm. the most. Okay. All right. Uh, so screenshot time <laughs> because. Uh, we talked about a lot of things and I want to make sure you can go and dive deep on all that stuff. So, um, huge so one. yeah, huge one today, lots of services. So, uh, um, I will put the, that notebook in, uh, in the usual repository. Just give me a few minutes after the session to do it. Cause obviously I was tweaking it until five minutes before the episode, but it worked. But it worked. <laughs> Uh, and uh, these are all the blog posts, okay? So uh, the, um, the first one is actually the one we uh, looked at with Greg. Okay. And then, you know, SageMaker debugger, SageMaker profiling, how to trigger Lambda functions to stop uh, bad training jobs detected by debugger. Uh, model tuning, which we didn't discuss, but it's, it's another good way to get to high accuracy models quicker. Spot training. Elastic inference savings plan. So my friends, you have a lot to read until next time. Okay. And uh, I think it's time to thank you. I can thank Greg once again for joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to all the colleagues who organized this and uh, answer your questions. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Sego, for the great interview <laughs> uh, and the moral support in, uh, in scaling this thing. Um, and we'll see you in two weeks. Two weeks. And I think we're gonna do auto ML. Oh, yeah, cool. SageMaker <laughs> autopilot. Uh, and so all you lazy machine learning engineers out there, <laughs> don't miss this one, right? One click, build a model, one go and have coffee, right? Work done, amazing. <laughs>
right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, feel free to connect. Feel free to ask us questions. Happy to uh, happy to answer and help you out. Say go. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Bye everybody. See you next time.